great. Uh, well, thank you for having me. As uh, was noted, this is not my first rodeo, uh, but this is uh, pretty spectacular. I don't think I've ever seen my slides look so big before. Uh, again, my name is Brian Imus. I'm the executive director with the Illinois Green Alliance. I want to just take some time. First of all, thank you for having me. Love being here, Benny. And I think what I really like, and I don't know why I keep getting invited to come back, it's just a great opportunity for me to share all the fun, great work that Illinois Green Alliance is doing um, to um, serve the building industry here in Illinois. And I want to take my time today to be able to tell you a little bit about some of our work and what's focusing our work, um, and then specifically talk about some of the big policy initiatives that are, that are underway um, both with uh, implementation of the new law here in Chicago or in Illinois and with new policy being developed um, at the city of Chicago. Um, it's a really big deal. There's a lot happening that will have a huge impact on buildings. And one thing that I want to leave all of you with is the important role that you play as building professionals in influencing whatever that policy ends up being. I think that's really, really important. So for, I know a lot of people in the room, I recognize many of you, but for those that may not be familiar with Illinois Green Alliance, we're a nonprofit, mission-based, membership-driven organization. Mission is real simple and straightforward. We promote green buildings and sustainable communities. Um, when I say member-based, I mean um, individuals that are tied to buildings in some way, and uh, they're connected because they care and they're passionate about sustainability and the work that they do. So our members run the gambit of all kinds of different industries, from real estate to um, product manufacturers tied to buildings, architects, engineers, facilities managers, um, unions. Um, they all associate with us because they have a personal passion for sustainability and they want to make a difference in their community and what they're doing professionally matches with that. The, um, the other thing that I want to mention is that we're also the local voice for the U.S. Green Building Council and I think one of our greatest strengths in addition to our membership is that we really serve as a convener and we are bringing together um, folks from all kinds of different um, industry sectors, but also from pro different professional associations. In fact, we have um, uh, relationships and uh, formal partnerships with organizations like the Pacifals Alliance, the Carbon Leadership Forum, um, the Living uh, Building Collaborative, um, helping to just bring as many folks together as possible to share and to collaborate. Um, right now, we've got a big, bold, strategic vision where we want to get to a place in Illinois where every single building is a high performance net zero building by 2050. I get it. That's a really big bold vision to put out there. Um, that's why we have developed a strategic plan over the next couple of years to lay the foundation that gets us on the road to making that happen. And we are laser focused around three pillars to make that out happen. First and foremost is around professional education. That's our bread and butter work. Um, we've been doing this for 20 years. Um, I think that we're pretty good at it. Last year, for example, we put on nearly 70 education programs for building professionals on the latest trends and technologies and had over 3,600 people attend those events. I think that the reason that's successful, I don't put on those education programs. It's our members who um, know the topics, know what the trends are, know what people want to learn. Um, and so um, that's a big call to all of you to get involved and help influence the education that we do. Second, we need to identify what some of, what some of the systemic barriers are to all of the technologies and design best practices that we know are gonna get us on that path to every building being a high performance building. Um, and we're not gonna get there by inspiring one building at a time. We need to um, identify what those systemic barriers are and come up with policy solutions as building professionals so that we can actually scale those technologies and best practices in really meaningful ways. So policy is becoming a bigger and bigger part of the work that we're doing. And then third, a lot of times we hear it's just not feasible or affordable to do some of these technologies 
um, that we know work that get a building towards net zero in a lot of different building types, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's um, schools or churches or community centers, to help overcome um, that, what I'll call a falsehood, is we've started to develop community education projects where our members are volunteering their time and their expertise to actually implement some of these technologies in those building types to show that it works. So for example, the Illinois Green Schools Project um, is working with 45 different schools around the state of Illinois. Uh, the Neighborhood um, Power Project is working with nonprofits that own their own buildings and helping them to reduce their energy burden to make a huge difference. Um, so those are the three pillars on, on, on the work that we're doing. I want to talk specifically about what's happening related to policy um, right now. I think we all are aware that the climate crisis is really driving a lot of the policy that we're seeing. Um, for example, we just saw IRA passed, or IRA, depending on what you want to call it, um, at the federal level. That's going to have a huge impact. There's going to be a lot of funding and financing available for a lot of different projects. Um, there's a lot happening at the state level as well, and at the city level. Um, so, first and foremost, just about this time last year, uh, Governor Pritzker signed into law uh, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. And I, I don't want to assume, but like, have folks heard of the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, often called CJA? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty big deal. It is certainly um, a bold law. It is hands down the nation's leading and most comprehensive climate and equitable jobs uh, law in the country. Um, it puts Illinois on a path to 100% clean energy by 2045. It protects public health from pollution. It provides a just transition um, for a lot of people whose jobs are tied to dirty fossil fuel, particularly um, downstate, um, and it enacts tough um, utility accountability measures. This is CJA by the numbers. You can see all the numbers here. Um, the one thing that I want to stress here, it's a 900-page law. The state legislature passed this, the governor signed it, but the decision points that are most important are in the rulemaking and the implementation over the coming years. And there are a lot of different opportunities for all of us to influence um, exactly how the law is um, successfully implemented. There's two pieces to the law that I think are most relevant to all of us. First, um, it dramatically expands um, energy efficiency. Um, so, the energy efficiency, energy efficiency programs, the electric energy efficiency programs, were to expire in 2030. They're now extended, and they've been dramatically um, increased in how much money is available. Over the, um, in fact, three times um, uh, more money now available. Um, for how uh, this all works. And the other thing that I think is really important to note is that um, large energy users who um, uh, didn't used to be able to take advantage of these energy efficiency programs can now either opt in or opt out and develop their own energy efficiency plans. The thing that I want to stress that you're looking at here is just the cycle of how the uh, plans are um, set where the utilities over time, every three years, have to determine how they structure, how the money will be spent. And it's really important for all of us to be thinking about what's working and what's not, what's incentivizing um, retrofits, what's not working, and is it really getting us to the reductions that we need to see. The second piece to the law that I think is really important, this is really, really exciting, um, it directs the Capital Development Board to establish a stretch energy code um, that it would allow municipalities all over the state, if they choose, to adopt a residential and commercial building code with higher energy efficiency outcomes uh, than the statewide base code. Um, the stretch energy code would also apply uh, to any project in the state that's funded by the Capital Development Board. There, the, the way this is gonna work, they actually started the process to um, research and then write what the stretch energy code is going to be last week. There's an advisory council, uh, an energy efficiency advisory council that will um, that has started this process. Um, the timeline for this, they're going to have a draft by July, 
and there'll be a public comment period between July and December when it's finally adopted. A couple of things. One, all of us can participate in the process. Those advisory council meetings are open to the public and any of us can participate. And we can also weigh in on the comment period to make sure that what the stretch code looks like is actually feasible and affordable and works and is something that municipalities are going to want to adopt. Um, second, the law, CJA, requires that that advisory council have five new um, technical experts from within the building industry to serve on that advisory council. And Illinois Green, along with several other organizations, um, actually reached within our own membership and put together a slate of folks that we thought had that type of expertise. And four of the five new folks that are now on that advisory council writing the stretch code are folks that we were able to recommend from within our industry. So that's the implementation of a law that's already been passed. At the city level, they're just starting the process of looking at how to decarbonize buildings in Chicago. I'm convinced we're going to see a lot of action in the next couple of months um, for a couple of different reasons. First, um, earlier this year, the mayor's office released the Climate Action Plan, um, the first major update to the Climate Action Plan in over a decade that's setting the goals and driving the need for more policy. Second, the uh, city and the mayor's office pulled together the Building Decarbonization Policy Working Group, made up of 40, uh, over 50 different uh, individuals from around the city uh, representing different constituencies. Uh, they sat down and started thinking about what will it take to actually decarbonize buildings in Chicago. Um, I can tell you there are 26 recommendations that are going to be released. I don't know when those recommendations are going to be released but my gut tells me it could be as soon as next week. That is gonna drive a lot of action by the city council and the mayor's office. A Couple of things that I think we can expect as recommendations uh, that are most relevant to all of us. Um, first, a uh, recommendation that a uh, new ordinance passed um, to um, dramatically limit uh, any gas hookups in any new construction building moving forward. Second, uh, to amend the energy benchmarking ordinance to change the, thres the threshold from 50,000 square feet or greater for the buildings that have to publicly report their energy use and bring that down to any building 25,000 square feet or bigger. And then third, uh, the development of a building performance standard for the city of Chicago. Um, There are 10, this is a relatively new policy. Uh, it's a policy that requires buildings. It gives flexibility to buildings to actually meet targets to reduce their energy use over a prescribed amount of time. As I said, it's a relatively new policy. There's only 10 policies like this that have been adopted around the country. Um, I don't know if folks work in buildings or have had to enact or, or respond to any of these policies out there? Is this like a relatively new concept to folks? Have people heard of a building performance standard before? Um, you're gonna hear a lot about it, I think, moving forward. Because Mayor Lightfoot made a public pledge um, and joined the National um, Building Performance Standard Coalition, where she promised um, by Earth Day 2024, she would pass a building performance standard for the city of Chicago. She joined that pledge with 32 other municipalities around the country, including um, Evanston, Milwaukee, Ann Arbor, uh, Grand Rapids. In signing the pledge, uh, the Biden administration, the Department of Energy, and the EPA are going to be providing uh, resources and assistance in helping to uh, craft that and implement that policy. It's a really exciting policy. There's a lot of decision points that need to be made in exactly how a building performance standard is going to impact the majority of buildings in Chicago and require them, mandate that they do retrofits. Um, everything from what are the metrics, 
Um, is it site EUI? Is it uh, greenhouse gas reductions? Uh, so what are those, tar what, how prescriptive is it? What flexibility is given to the building owner in um, meeting those targets? Um, what buildings are actually covered by the ordinance? So all of those decisions are gonna be made through the writing of a building performance standard. So there's a lot of policy coming. Uh, it's gonna have a huge impact on the industry and on buildings. Uh, at Illinois Green, we've been thinking, gosh, regardless of whatever policy passes, let's make sure that there is a resource uh, for building owners so that compliance is easy and affordable and possible. And so we've been exploring the idea of creating um, what essentially is called a Chicago Building Performance Hub that actually brings together and convenes um, a lot of the experts so that there's a one-stop shop for a service provider in a building, a facilities manager, a building owner, anybody in the building industry, so that they can uh, know how to comply with any law, but they're also able to get the one-on-one um, -on -one attention they need to understand what technologies are out there, um, what's a, uh, what are some of the financing mechanisms that are available to them. These are things that we've um, done in our education programs and explored over time, um, but the intention here is how can we create um, a formal place that just brings the, everything together. To figure out whether this makes sense or not, we actually um, partnered with the Building Energy Exchange and the Institute for Market Transformation. The Building Energy Exchange has actually been around for over 10 years in New York City and is essentially one of these high performance building homes. We uh, engaged with them to actually do a needs assessment and get a lay of the land here in Chicago. If we were to do a Chicago high performance building hub, um, what should it be? How should it operate? Who's doing what already? Um, and we learned a lot from that process. We did 40 one on one interviews with folks from different industries, and we did a whole, um, uh, we did a survey of hundreds of folks in the industry as well, um, in large part because we were able to partner and get the survey out um, through BOMA and even through the City of Chicago's Buildings Department. So we got a lot of data and a lot of information on what folks are looking for if we were able to um, pull together a building performance hub so that we can make whatever policy happen um, uh, easy to implement. So that's it. That hopefully gives you a good lay of the land on what's happening. This is a little self-promotion um, on just some of the things that I was touching on. You can see some of the education programs that we provided uh, recently, the Neighborhood Power Project, Green Schools Project. Of course, everyone on October 6th should come to Limelight. What I really want to leave you all with is the opportunities and the places where you all can weigh in on policy that's happening right now. I can't stress enough in my work how there are a lot of policymakers out there who don't understand building science. They may know how to write laws, but they don't know actually how buildings operate. Uh, and certainly there are a lot of building professionals out there. You don't need to know about um, the sausage making process and writing a policy, but it's critical that those policymakers hear from building professionals. And so we're creating a bunch of different opportunities to make sure that, that building professionals get connected with policymakers and they know what's happening out there already. Um, so that whatever law they do craft, it's realistic, it's affordable, it's feasible. A um, couple of examples of what we've been doing. Um, we're partnering with AIA Illinois right now to do a series of building tours of high performance building projects that already exist. And we're just inviting policymakers. And they're going on the tour with either the contractor or the owner um, to actually hear about their experience. One of the best experiences I had in doing one of these tours, uh, a state legislator, uh, he just, he just turned to the contractor and said, what could I do to make your job easier? What was really fascinating was just his answer was something that I would have never thought of. He just said that uh, um, uh, worker costs are high, more training would be really, really helpful for me to be able to hire more people to work on high performance projects like this. So it's just really interesting to be able to make sure that that communication is happening. 
The second thing that we're doing is uh, convening what we call the um, Building Professionals Advocacy Group. We meet every month, and it's a way for building professionals who um, represent different industry associations who are interested in advocacy to just come together every month and talk about what's happening, share what's happening, um, see what um, uh, education needs to be happening out there. Um, and that is available to everybody, and I encourage everyone to get involved in all of that work. With that, I will turn it back to our MC. Thank you, Brian. Just a few seconds. Um, anyone have questions for Brian? Is there something that you would recommend, like, it's okay if the answer is no, but that people could go home tonight and do? Is there something so urgent that you wish people knew that they could do, or is the most important thing on the, um, like, next July, weighing in in the common period, would you say? Yeah. Go to our website, and there's a spot on your website on our website where you can say, "I'm interested in keeping up to date on advocacy efforts." And you'll be added to a list to know what's happening and how you can wait. I also think that one thing that's really important is oftentimes what's really important, like with CJA, it's a law that's already passed. One of the things we're doing is just providing education on what the new law means or where where the where the financing um, touch points are for for folks in the industry. That's another thing that we're doing to identify those places though, we need to hear from all of you about what you need to know and what you need to know about. I mentioned there are 10, uh, 10 factors for the building performance, or 10, 10 measures for the building performance rating that you guys have. Can you just talk a little bit about them? Or oh, where I can find it at least on the website? Yeah, I, I would encourage you to um, check out the Institute for Market Transformations website. Um, there's not necessarily 10, I don't know if I said 10, but there are a lot of different um, decision points that need to be made. And, and what's interesting is when you go to the Institute for Market Transformation, I mentioned that there are 10 of these laws already on the books. They're all operating differently and they're all measuring different things and they all have different enforcement mechanisms. What I'm trying to learn is from building professionals in some of those cities, like in New York City, where they already have, uh, where they already have a building performance standard. Um, there's a lot of feedback on what's working, but also what's not working, and let's not, you know, make the same mistake. So. Thank you. Paul, you don't need money. I don't need money. Uh, Brian, um, I'm I'm interested in what the uh, Illinois Green Alliance is doing with respect to the. Inflation Reduction Act, because a lot of things changed rather surprisingly that we got something done for climate and or other parts of it. But what specifically is Illinois and, and your organization doing to disseminate that, again, rather lengthy bill and help professionals like us educate our industry in terms of what they can be doing today? It didn't exist just a few weeks ago. Uh, just last week I was on a call with colleagues in a few other cities, uh, Kansas City, St. Louis, and uh, uh, D.C. and New York, uh, where they have these high-performance building hubs already, and uh, we were talking about how we might want to collaborate specifically on a series of education programs related to IRA and what it means for building professionals. Um, so expect uh, some emails on the uh, education programs shortly, probably next month. And then we'll want to create a series of them. So give us some feedback on what elements of IRA you're most interested in learning about. Uh, I'll flip it back to the other way, which is I'll, I'll volunteer to help on specifically what we're going to do in Illinois. Please do. Please do. Please do. There so you I go. <laughs> uh, you should also just sign up as a member. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps the lights on. <laughs> I uh, really enjoyed your talk, lots of things there all have to buy you a drink of reception to ask some of my, my questions. But so as the air quality guy, I'll have to ask, you know, um, you're talking about sustainability here, but it sounds like electrification, decarbonization, energy efficiency. When I open up you know, lead, I see, you know, indoor environmental quality, but you can just flatline that at standard 62.1. What are you doing to try to 
raise the bar for your order quality. Pretty soon, the most hazardous environments will ever be in or inside. That's why I can probably address that. I don't specifically, you know, work in buildings to actually um, address indoor air quality, but I think that, um, you know, one thing that that we're always doing related to, to this is why does this work matter to people and how do you measure it so that it matters to people? And doing building electrification, doing all of the sustainability work has to create more jobs. It has to have health benefits to people. You need to make that connection for people. Otherwise, they're not going to support a lot of these policies that we're talking about. Um, well, that's true. Of course, I, I'm on the Clean Air Act Advisory Committee. One of the things we're trying to do is get the Clean Air Act to actually cover indoor air, too, which is it's a problem. There's no regulation of indoor air. And I just kind of worry about these efforts, even if they succeed, kind of leaving behind the, the occupants. And the same thing with building performance standards. I don't think it's a building performance standard unless it starts with what is the quality of the environment for the occupants. I'm 100% beside behind what you're doing, but I, I think that. It, it needs to be broadened, and we need to, to, to bring those two groups together in the National Air Quality Standards. We need to, to focus on raising that part, too. Otherwise, we could say we, we succeeded in one area and not really change anything, and none of it's important. The one other comment I'll say education is great, but we've been telling people about why things are important and, and why they work for years in the energy arena, and they don't do them. And it's the same thing for indoor air quality. And my suggestion is get a behavioral scientist on your team. I think this all comes down to behavioral economics and how you present messages. And facts don't work. It's been demonstrated that just being right isn't enough. So somehow you get pitch it in the right way. And behavioral science, I think, has some of the keys to that. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, one other piece, and I, you're absolutely right, your comments on making an action to to help. Um, one of the things that CJA did that I kind of skipped over very quickly uh, an identified problem with some of the energy efficiency utility programs is that somebody would go to a home to be able to start doing some work and realize that there was mold or a health hazard and there was no money to do anything and so they had to pull back and not do any of the energy efficiency work. CJA actually created a fund for health and safety. So when somebody comes to do weatherization and you identify a health and safety hazard, there's now funding available to first address that and then um, be able to move forward with the. Thank you. Great. Any further? Yes. Really quick, I just wonder if there's a list that's published somewhere of the AIA. Um, high performance building tours that are being attended by policymakers somewhere? Uh, we don't publicly make that available. I need to look <laughs> <laughs> okay. you email me and then um, we're looking for more tours, you know, more buildings oh, to tour. Yeah. So if you have suggestions, I actually really asked helpful. one of my former employers about it and a few people had nice suggestions. Yep. Get in touch with <laughs> uh, also, on our website, we've created a net zero watch list. An honor roll of net zero buildings happening here, so you might want to check that out. Uh, and then we're also doing some storytelling where we're actually um, doing some case studies of actual high performance buildings. Um, so, and always looking for more to share. Well, thank you. Quick question How does Chicago and the state of Illinois? Uh, compared to the rest of the country, other cities and other states, as far as we behind them, about to compete with them or ahead of them? I hate this question. If you had asked me 10 years ago, we were leaving the country, and I think over time we've started to slip and fall behind. And hopefully, some of the efforts that I'm talking about. Um, get us caught up with some of our peers. Well, that's, that's a, that's that's a diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for your thoughtful questions, and Brian, for all the work that you're doing. Thank you all very much. <laughs>